Hi, hello, ladies and gents. Um, this is Mrs. B here, and we're looking at the Great Depression notes. So you could go ahead and get yourself set uh, and get ready to take notes. Go ahead and put everything away, uh, except for your paper and pencil, and essentially copy the slides if you've got that, um, so that we can run through these together. That would be most it. Right. So the Great Depression uh, that you are looking at right here, the span of years, this decade or so from 1929 to 1939, um, is of course the largest and most significant economic depression in our nation's history. The beginning and the ending dates are a little bit, um, well, a little bit flexible. The beginning date is not so much. Pretty much 1929 with the crash of the stock market is when the depression starts. But the end date, sometimes you'll see something a little later than 39. Basically, the Great Depression is going to be ended by World War II. So either you're going to see people go with 1939, which, of course, is when the war starts in Europe, or you're going to see them go with, like, 1941 or 42, which is when the United States actually enters the war. So at the latest, you might see the Great Depression ending in 42, but usually 29 to 39 is, is the, the dates that we get stuck with. Uh, the Great Depression is super, super, super important. Very um, key turning point in American history. If I had to rank it, it's definitely one of the top three turning points behind maybe only the American Revolution and World War II itself. Uh, it permanently changes a lot of things about our government and our economy and the way that those two interact. It's going to shape the modern-day Democratic Party. Um, so this is a major, like, turning point topic right smack in the 20th century, and it's something that comes up very, very frequently on the AP exam. So here we go. All right, so some background. We need to know, of course, um, going into it. The 1928 election is coming off a series of, um, I would say, popular, at least like moderately popular Republican presidents, right? We had Harding, who died. And then we had Calvin Coolidge, who's been president up till now, up to 1928. Um, and so the guy who's going to run on the Republican ticket to replace Coolidge is Herbert Hoover, who is very much just sort of like a standard Republican. He's actually very popular himself. He was part of a really um, well-regarded relief agency during World War I, and um, he's maybe even like a little more progressive than Coolidge, not that that takes much, um, but so he's a, sort of very popular. And then the other reason, if you're taking a look at this and you're like, wow, why is this such a big landslide, um, especially why do some of these southern states vote for Hoover? Large part of that is because of who the Democratic ticket goes with. Um, this guy named Al Smith, and Al Smith happens to be the first Catholic that we've ever had run on a major party ticket, and there were still a lot of prejudices against Catholics in this time period, kind of dating back to like way back when you're talking about um, Irish immigration in like the 1830s. So, you know, the, the whole idea that they're papists or they're sort of controlled by the Pope and it's undemocratic. Those types of things still linger. It's very kind of nativist um, in a way. So there's enough, uh, you know, immigrants and kind of urbanites, um, you know, to get Smith a, uh, a nomination for the Democratic Party, but not enough to carry him into office. Also worth noting, like when we take a look at the popular vote, because we're going to see a couple of these um, in this note set, 58% for Hoover. That's a it's pretty solid popular vote margin. Usually it's, it's closer to, you know, like 49, 51 or something like that. Um, Hoover is one of those people who kind of winds up being in the wrong place at the very wrong time. Like he's, there's nothing particularly different about him from other presidents. He's no worse than Megan Harding or Coolidge or some of our laissez-faire presidents like uh, Grover Cleveland or people like that. Um, but he's going to kind of run at the wrong time. He runs on this platform of continued prosperity. Um, they Actually, there were people in the Hula campaign who talked about like ending poverty permanently in the United States as a result of this boom that was going on in the 1920s that a lot of people thought would just sort of continue indefinitely. The slogan on the screen there is Hoover's campaign slogan, so two cars in every garage and a chicken in every pot, sort of promising like a comfortable kind of working class, middle class life for all Americans. Um, unfortunately for Hoover, of course, he's only going to be president for a few months before the stock market crashes. He's inaugurated in March of 1929. We used to inaugurate our presidents in March, and then the stock market crash is going to happen in October. Even when Hoover was elected, certainly when he was inaugurated, and then certainly in the months between his inauguration and the stock market crash, in hindsight, like looking back on it from today, we can very clearly see some signs that the economy was shaky. Um, and one of those signs is this wave of like really heavy stock market speculation that starts in about 1928, 1927 ish. Um, speculation, remember, means it's essentially like saying gambling on the stock market. So you are buying stock um, at a rate that is not really necessarily dependent on the, the value of the company itself, but it's more dependent on what you think you know, is, is going to come up in the future. So people are speculating really wildly. They're also doing what's called 
buying on margin. This is something that is illegal today as a result of how badly it hits the stock market. And what this means is that you're buying the stock by paying only a small percent down and then you're borrowing the rest. In the 20s, you could buy stock with as little as 10% down. So it'd be like if you were buying a $100 stock and you only had to put down $10 of your own money, and you could just take out a loan against the rest. It, it creates a lot of problems, as you might imagine. So because of these practices, we see stock markets rising rapidly faster and faster and faster. This is what's called a bubble when prices rise faster than um, the value of, of any good. We usually talk about it in stock markets. It's a good uh, metaphor, actually, if you can picture a bubble that's just this sort of thin thing that's not really supported by anything underneath or doesn't seem like it's supported by anything. Um, and uh, so other problems as well that are detailed on the um, on the slide here, the other thing that I want to point out before we get in is that in the 20s and prior to this, remember that there's really a, a very lax, if any, regulation on banks and businesses. Um, the Fed is around, but it's still like really new. Um, it's only, let's see, it was formed under President Wilson towards the beginning of his presidency in about 1914. So when the stock market crashes, it's only about 15 years old. Um, it hasn't really been around that long, and our financial system is, um, is a certainly operational, but not very well regulated by the government. So um, the stock market crash happens in October of 1929. The very famous long free fall is this one here on Tuesday of October 1929. Um, but it starts like a day or so earlier. So you get this Thursday, October 24th, there's this little glitch you're looking at here on the, the graph is the Dow Jones Industrial Index. So you can see it rising here through 28. Here's 28 when the bubble speculation starts. You can see that just like shooting upwards. And then this little like, and mini drop right there. That's that Thursday, October 24th. And we have this little bobble. People are kind of nervous and kind of on edge. The market seems like it's recovering a little bit. Uh, it's always a weak rally. And then um, that's, that's Friday. And then there would be Monday as well. And then that Tuesday, October 29th, early in the morning um, after the markets open that morning, a, uh, one of the big businesses gets like a, a, essentially a bad earnings report. And uh, several key investors see that and start to sell off their stock. And what happens is just this panic. Um, you know, when you're looking at stock values, you are um, you know, thinking, oh my gosh, you can see those guys selling, the price is falling, should we sell now before we lose money? Like, sell now, sell now. And there's this, this level of panic that rolls through. Today, actually, one of the things that they can and do do on the stock market is they can actually pause trading. So if this type of thing started to happen today, if there was like a free fall in the markets, what they would do is they would shut down trading so that people can like, you know, go home and have a nap and like take a breather for a second and kind of regroup and you know look at their finances and then ideally when trading opens back up you kind of it calms that panic but that didn't exist in this time period so the whole day is just this giant like panic as people try to sell whatever they can for however much they can and by the time the markets close it's it's the single greatest like percentage drop in stock market history so if you take a look at this this graphic that's on the screen this one single long downhill slide right there we that is the single day tuesday october 29th 1929 so um i mean if you take a look at that as like a percentage of the market value it's, it's extremely high so the stock market crash is very scary, right? And it's a really extreme event. But the stock market has crashed before, right? It's not like we've never had a stock market crash before. There was a pretty big one in 1893. We had a little depression then. And it's only about 10% of Americans in 1929 who were invested in the stock market. I have a tiny majority up here, it's just a little under 10%, like 9.9% or something like that, of people in the country were invested in the stock market in some way. So it's not like, you know, overnight, you know, everybody wakes up on October 30th poor or anything. So the question then becomes um, not just like, okay, the stock market crashes, but how do we get from the stock market crashing to, a, you know, a, a global depression, you know, in the space of just a few months? What is it? that makes this depression the Great Depression, that extends it, that lengthens it, that like deepens it in a lot of ways, and that's kind of what we're going to be looking at here. So the, the basic chain that we're going to go through here, okay, so the stock market crashes, right, about 10% of, of Americans have lost some significant amount of money for the most part. Some, some people do okay, but for the most part, businesses lose a, a good amount of money. Um, and so, you know, that, that's worrisome. A lot of these people who are wealthy and middle class who have lost money are also people who own businesses, right? They own industrial businesses or they're managers of businesses. And if you take a sec to think about what often happens when um, people who own businesses lose a lot of money, like if you owned an auto manufacturing plant and you lost 
$100 million in the stock market, what you would probably have to do is you'd probably have to start downsizing or maybe sell off your plant or maybe close it, right, if you don't have the money to keep it open. So what happens, like, within the next few weeks after the stock market crash is we start to see, like, downsizing or closing of businesses. So they'll shut down hours, they'll reduce, so you used to be full-time, now you're only pulling 20 hours a week, that type of thing. There's a sort of a general sense of unease about the effects of the stock market crash, what's going to happen, how is this going to impact ordinary people. Um, so the business is closing and downsizing is one thing. You know, you, if you go from being full-time to part-time or whatever, if you've got a lot of nice savings and you're sort of living comfortably, you can kind of like make that work, right? But the problem is, as you may remember from our discussion of the 1920s economy, that a lot of people are living largely on installment plan payments. So their house and their car and their radio and uh, their refrigerator and all their you know, living room furniture, that's all on payment plans. So when you lose your job or when you lose hours, it's not just that like, oh, well, we need to tighten our belts for a little while. It's like, okay, we can't pay for anything because we don't actually own any of it, right? So we, this is how we get people go from being, you know, kind of comfortably middle-class lifestyle to being just like dirt poor and living in trash houses in, in a very short amount of time, largely because of this sort of installment plan lifestyle. When you know that you can't make payments, the first thing you're going to try to do is hopefully go to the bank and withdraw whatever savings you had. Um, and the problem with this is, of course, that the banks themselves were not very stable. Um, so there was no regulation on banks in this time period. And so a lot of them were um, doing things that are illegal today. Like, number one, um, many of them were taking money that people deposited in the bank. So let's say you put $10,000 in the bank. Today, they have to hold a certain amount of that on hand so that, like, when you go to withdraw it, you know, some of that money still stays in the bank itself instead of just going back out into circulation. But in this time period, what a lot of banks were doing with that money was they were playing the stock market. So a lot of banks had lost essentially customer deposit money in the stock market crash. Now, that's not a big deal as long as I'm not trying to withdraw my entire $10,000 at once. But if I am, and especially if I'm not the only one who's doing that because, you know, the, the local mill closed down and everyone in our town needs money at the same time, what happens are these runs on banks. And this is when a bunch of people flood a bank, they're asking for big withdrawals, like their entire deposit or part of their deposit, and the bank can't pay out. It doesn't have enough money, like, available to pay out on everybody's deposits. And what happens then is that banks close. Um, bank closures, like the closures of banks, it, this is really what, when the Great Depression hits home for, like, ordinary people, average people, right? This is when the depression becomes like a real thing for a lot of people who are just kind of, you know, working class and like living their life and didn't have any stock market money. Um, the closure of banks, you know, people's entire life savings are lost. Remember that there's no social security, there's no, you know, and I mean, none of that stuff exists. So, you know, if you've been saving up your entire life and you've got, you know, $5,000 in the bank or 10000 in the bank for your retirement and it's just not there anymore, that really, really um, impacted people very deeply. So if you get people committing suicide and, I mean, it's just the really um, uh, impactful part of the Great Depression. Once the banks start to close, people really um, start to panic. Once people panic, they're not spending money, you know, oh, we're not going to go on vacation, we're not going to, you know, buy those extra groceries, we're not going to buy a new house. Um, so that sort of grinds the economy to a halt, it starts to spiral downward, and we enter the, the Great Depression itself. Right? Um, just for some sort of statistical stuff, in the three years following 1929, the, the GNP, which is essentially how much we're producing, drops by almost 50%. So when I say the economy grinds to a halt, like that's, that's what we mean. It, it, we, we stop producing. I mean, we're, we're still producing some, but all less than half um, of what we were producing before. Um, uh, almost 6,000 banks fail, like 6,500 plus some odd banks fail all the way across the country, urban banks, rural banks, all over the country. That's a lot. That's a big percentage of the banks in the U.S., um, and farm prices, which were already low for farmers, are going to fall an additional 60% more. Unemployment rate in the Great Depression is very difficult to calculate. Normal unemployment, like any given year, is going to be somewhere under 5%. That's just, you know, normal people who, have, you know, don't have a job for whatever reason and aren't looking. Um, and it was 3% in 1929, and it goes up to at least 25%, and some estimates say as high as a third or like 33%. Um, and keep in mind that this is only calculating people who have, like, like jobs where they work for someone. So this doesn't include like all the Americans who are farmers and, you know, lose their farms. Or So it's, it's a really, really high rate of unemployment. Just for perspective's sake, in this last big economic crisis that we had, the national unemployment rate at like the, the worst was about 15%. And that was really 
serious. Like I knew, and you you guys probably knew people who were looking for work. It was very felt. So if that was, you know, 15%, to think about 25 or 33% unemployment is really um, stunning. It's really shocking to think about. So there's a lot of text on this slide. I, I don't want to hit on too much of it necessarily, but just the way that this is set up um, is, is hopefully a good reminder of the structure that we're looking at here. So when you get asked a question about the cause of the Great Depression, yes, the stock market crash is the cause, but it, it's important to think of it more so as a catalyst rather than the sole cause. It's not just like stock market crashes, depression. There's all of this stuff that's gone before the Great Depression, right? So all these things that we talked about in the 1920s notes, overproduction, people living above their means, unequal distribution, lack of regulations. And then in addition, down here under the blue arrow, is all this stuff that happens like in the wake of the Great Depression that, that deepen or lengthen the Great Depression. So one thing that happens is the Federal Reserve Board um, makes uh, uh, what we know today to be a bad move. What they do is they reduce the amount of money in circulation. They basically raise interest rates really high. This is like literally the exact opposite of what we do today. So when there is a financial crisis, what the conventional wisdom today is that you lower interest rates to encourage people to buy more um, and, and to spend more, um, as it were. So that's that's one thing that happens. Um, the other thing that's going on is the Holly Smoot tariff. Remember that the Republicans, and this is like longstanding since like there have been Republicans are, are very into this idea of protectionist tariffs, right? Tariffs to protect American businesses. And so in the sort of panic over the, the depression in 1930, they're gonna, the Congress is gonna pass a really um, high protective tariff called the Holly Smoot tariff is an excellent name for a tariff. Um, and what it does, as the slide says, is it raises domestic tariffs to really, really high levels. Um, but the actual impact is that it, um, it kind of uh, upsets a bunch of other foreign countries who then are like, okay, well, we'll show you. And they raise their own tariffs, basically grinding global trade to a halt, and then the depression spreads worldwide. So, you know, like, oops. Um, it starts here in the United States, but it spreads to encompass basically like everybody we trade with. So most of Western Europe um, a little bit, smells a little bit in Asia, but not so much. Um, the country that's going to get hit the hardest by the Great Depression is, of course, Germany, which is already having trouble paying reparations. So all the stuff on the slide, again, are sort of long-term, short-term, kind of proximate causes of the Great Depression. There are many, and it's important to view it as, as like a complex event that doesn't just happen because of one thing, but happens because of a lot of long-term economic weaknesses and sort of short-term poor decisions on the part of the government. Um, so just a couple of images of some of the stuff we're talking about. This is a picture of a run on the bank, right? What you're looking at here is, well, this is the Bank of New York, if I'm not mistaken. What you're looking at here is all of these people crowding outside these shuttered and locked doors. These are um, most likely either all depositors, people who had money in the bank, or like onlookers looking loose. Um, and once the bank is shuttered like that, you know, any money that you have in there is basically just gone. There's no insurance. There's no safety net for it. Um, other things that we see a lot, there were no... Uh, like structures, I guess you could say, to provide um, like food relief at all to people. So in cities, you see a tremendous amount of like charities um, like the Salvation Army and the Red Cross and YMCA churches are going to set up these, they're called bread lines or soup kitchens, where people could wait in line sometimes all day for like free food for sort of relief food. Um, you can see this in this bottom picture here, this sort of tent that they've got set up and then just let's take a look at this like enormous line that stretches all the way back here all the way around and all the way around. So if you're like this dude back here, right, you're spending probably your whole day in line um, here, you know, rather than maybe, you know, trying to go down to the docks and see if you can get some work for a day. So the, you know, relatively quickly, we see people who are having a very difficult time sort of taking care of their family and feeding everyone. Um, street corner selling became also very common. People would try to scavenge up whatever they could um, to try to sell. So you can see unemployed by apples, five cents each. It's not going to help out much, but it can't hurt. Another thing that a lot of people um, really try to do is sell firewood, like to go around to like empty houses and, you know, tear boards off people's old picket fences and stuff like that and bundle it up and try to sell it as firewood. That was fairly common. Um, it, you know, people really wind up having to make some really, really tough decisions as a result of the Great Depression. Um, in my own family, the, um, there was a, the blended family with my grandmother had some full siblings and some half siblings. And when the Great Depression happened, her stepfather essentially sent her and her full siblings to live in an orphanage for five to six years because they just legitimately could not afford to feed them. Um, and so those, those are the types of choices that, that a lot of people, you know, found themselves faced with very quickly, um, you know, after the Depression itself happened. 
Um, the, many people, um, you know, were able to just sort of downsize housing. So you used to live in a nice middle class, you know, town home, and now you live in an apartment, that kind of thing. But some people fell very far, very quickly, and wound up living not even in any sort of legal shelter, but in what we would call a shanty or a, a illegally constructed house made of scrap goods, you know, cardboard or you know, scrap wood or corrugated metal or whatever you can find on whatever land you could find to sort of squat on, you know, land at the end of a dump or on a railroad tracks or, in a, you know, at the outskirts of a public park, those types of things. And when a lot of these houses were gathered together, which they did often, the term that people used to refer to them was Hooverville. So the term Hooverville, again, refers to like a shanty community that springs up in the Great Depression. And it's also a really good sign of um, how a lot of people, not everyone, but a lot of people feel about the president. Like when you're naming your trash house after the president, you're probably not that fond of him, right? They they also called like, if you mixed ketchup with water, that was Hoover soup, and if you were sleeping under a blanket, or excuse me, under a newspaper, that was a Hoover blanket. <clears throat> so they were doing, I mean, there was a lot of anger, uh, frustration at the president who was who was perceived not to be doing very much, um, whether that's fair or not, we'll talk about in just a sec here, but there were a lot of people who blamed him for not just the depression itself so much, but the response of the government to the depression, that was fairly common. So one of the largest two in the country in Seattle over here, you can see the train yards in the back, um, they're fairly established, and this is that same Hooverville burning to the ground in 1940. Um, Hoovervilles were extremely dangerous, I mean, like real fire traps, like disease spread, um, and the hotbeds of crime. I mean, anything you can imagine, people who are very poor living in close to crowded conditions, that's, that was the Hoovervilles, which is really, really not very nice. Another thing that happens in addition to the Hoovervilles is a lot of people just kind of take off and leave, especially young men, um, you know, either men who are on their own or men who are going to pick up and um, that leave their families essentially, uh, looking for work, looking for jobs, just looking for something, anything. We see a tremendous amount of train hopping, hoboism, as it was known, um, either riding in empty box cars or riding on top um, of the, the car sometimes, you know, just, just moving around the country looking for some sort of firmness, some stability. Um, so how was Hoover responding to all of this? Uh, not well. <laughs> you talk to a lot of people who are not Hoover fans, generally what they will say was, well, Hoover didn't do anything or Hoover did nothing. Well, that's, that's of course not true. Right? He wasn't just sitting there literally for four years doing nothing. But what he does do is he, he's very limited by his own personal philosophy. Right? Hoover was a self-made man. You know, he grew up as, as essentially an orphan, and he was a millionaire by the time he was 40. So he just really firmly believed in, like, social Darwinism or what we call rugged individualism, this idea that people should sort of, like, pull themselves up by their own bootstraps. Uh, it's a common belief in the time period, but it, it's just not working so well anymore. Um, so he would advocate these, these two terms right here, voluntary non-coercive cooperation and associationalism, those are, are essentially synonyms. And what they both mean is that what Hoover wanted was for industries to work together to regulate themselves. So it would be like if all of the, whatever, the steel manufacturing, you know, companies get together and set like wage and price controls or those types of things. But he thought that the government could encourage that, but that it wasn't really possible for the government to actually regulate that. Um, I just don't think that he fully was like dialed into the, the scope of the problem. Um, and if he wasn't, then one thing should have driven it home to him, and that is the March of the Bonus Army. So we're going to see some isolated protest movements against the government, but the big one and the one that you would need to know about that might come up on the test question is the March of the Bonus Army in 1931. Uh, the Bonus Army was a group of World War I veterans who had been issued bonus bonds. So it's the type of thing where you get a piece of paper that says the government will pay you a bonus due in, I think they were due in like 1944 or something like that. So not yet, about 10, 15 years away. But these men um, wanted their pensions to be paid now. They basically said, you can keep the interest, we just want the money now, we're poor, we're starving, right? Um, so the leader is a guy named Walter W. Waters, and there's a, a bunch of, I think it winds up being about 40 or 50,000 um, veterans plus their families who are marching um, to Washington. They, they get to Washington, D.C., they set up like a camp outside of Washington, D.C. in an area called Anacostia Flats, and they, they essentially encamp there for a couple of months. Finally, um, Hoover has had enough of protesting veterans on his, figuratively on his lawn, um, and he orders the army, is under um, Eisenhower and uh, MacArthur at this point in time, to go out and to disperse the camp. They go out, they tell people to leave, and, and some people do, but the majority of them have to be driven out by burning down the camp, like with people in it. Um, I think one veteran and like a baby are killed in, in this, you know, sort of 
kind of melee that follows as people are like screaming and running from the camp and all that kind of thing. As you can imagine, the um, the media reaction on this is not that favorable to Hoover. We get headlines like this, you know, bonus marker, shacks of flame, veteran killed, you know, bloodshed, chaos. Like this does not look good for Hoover, right? Is if, if he was maintaining a, a you know any degree of popularity, this is really not going to help it at all. Um, the Despite that, uh, what you might think, he does decide to run for re-election in 1932. This has always surprised me a little. I think it's fairly good evidence that, that he really wasn't aware of the, the degree to which people blamed him for the catastrophe. Um, so he's going to run on the Republican Party ticket, and the Democrats are going to run uh, this gentleman right here on the screen, Franklin D. Roosevelt, current governor of New York, former like assistant undersecretary, part of a great um, political family. He's the distant cousin of Teddy Roosevelt. They're like seventh or eighth cousins, something like that. And he um, promises the country uh, this new deal, which he doesn't really define very fully in the uh, in his campaign, but it sounds really good. Like it sounds better than whatever Hoover is, you know, doing or not doing. Um, it's a very optimistic campaign about the possibility of government and about the idea that government can make a difference. Um, Roosevelt himself is kind of an interesting fellow. He had um, suffered a bout of polio that left him paralyzed and unable to stand or walk unaided when he was in his, oh, like his late 20s or thereabouts. Comes from a very wealthy family. That's that's he's, he's the little one right there with his legs jauntily crossed as FDR as a young boy. Um, and uh, he, he is in a wheelchair, but you almost never, this is one of the, like only two or three pictures that you'll ever see of him in a wheelchair. He was very private about it. It wasn't exactly a secret, but it wasn't very widely known either. If you look at pictures of Roosevelt, you will usually see him um, like he's standing behind something or he's sitting like in a car. He could wear um, like braces on or under his trousers so that he could sort of like they would stick in the legs so he could stand up, but he couldn't like walk really unaided. Um, they were because the media was as it, as it was then and not as it is today, they were able to keep that relatively quiet. So because of that though, his wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, um, is is like kind of the public face of the New Deal in a lot of ways. She goes to a lot of like ribbon cuttings. She is the one who, you know, when travels to, you know, Denver to open up a new plant or whatever. She does a lot of that type of stuff because it's harder for him to travel. And so she is going to become a very like active part of the New Deal in her own right. Um, and then even after he dies, she's going to continue to work with like the United Nations for a long time. So she's a pretty important historical figure in her own right. So the 1932 election, uh, and so it's not like, despite how much they can talk about people not liking Hoover, and and they didn't. Right? It's it's not like he gets no votes. I mean, Pennsylvania, that's a pretty big state, and 40% uh, of the popular vote. That's not awful. Or I think we've seen worse. Um, but uh, you know, it is a fairly solid landslide. Largely, it's not so much that people like Roosevelt, although they do. It is a little bit more of like a not Hoover vote in in many ways. So that's 1932 election. Um, this, these enduring understandings that are in the slides are coming directly out of the College Board curriculum. So this is like the College Board language about what they want you to know. There's a lot of text on here. You don't, shouldn't feel the need necessarily to write all of this down, but there are a couple of terms that I want to point out that you need to be familiar with, like what does the College Board mean when they say these things. And one of them is this limited welfare state here. So what it says is that the response of FDR in, in the New Deal, what they're talking about here, is going to be to transform the United States into a limited welfare state, meaning a state that takes care of people or provides services for people in some limited, in this case, ways that we're going to see expand later on in the in the century. Um, so we look at eventually things like Social Security. That's a good example of the limited welfare states, so government providing old age insurance for people. Um, and it's also going to, as we'll see by the time that we end this note set, uh, we sort of redefine what it means to be liberal. If you're talking about the term liberal as a political term in the United States, you can't really compare people who were called liberals in like the 1880s with people who are called liberals after the New Deal because it, the, the term is redefined to mean somebody who supports programs like the New Deal and supports, you know, big government action, etc. So you're talking about like, say, for example, Thomas Jefferson as a liberal, which we do, that can be confusing to people because it doesn't seem like he believes in the same thing that, say, Franklin Roosevelt does. But that's because, the, again, the New Deal sort of redefines our concept of what that term means. Um, and so those those terms, those two terminologies, this idea of a limited welfare state and then the idea of American liberalism, those are things to be just, again, aware of how the College Board uses and of the um, like importance that they place on the terms themselves. Okay. So immediately after taking office, FDR is going to jump right into like literally the same day as his inauguration is going to jump right in um, and order what he calls a bank 
holiday. Um, this sounds a lot more fun than it is. He's actually going to shut down every single bank in the country um, and rush government inspectors out and then um, check the bank, check their records, check their financials, make sure that they're sound and solid, like a bank that you can you know, trust to put your money in. And then the idea is that when they've been certified by the government that they are healthy and that they are following you know, laws and that they're treating their deposits correctly, that then they'll be allowed to reopen. And what the, the thought here is, is that you're trying to sort of rebuild people's confidence in banks, in the idea that like I can put my money in this bank and it's not going to disappear tomorrow, which as you can imagine, a lot of people were very worried about. So what he creates to do that, to create that confidence, something that's still around today, it's called the F. DIC, the Federal Depositors Insurance Corporation, and um, what this does is it's a government regulatory agency that monitors banks to make sure that they're following regulations correctly in, in regards to, you know, deposits kept on hand, etc. And it ensures any bank that is part of the FDIC is insured by the government, and if that bank closes suddenly, then you will get back from the government uh, with up to, at least up to $150,000 that you had in the bank itself. Um, so the FDIC is a really good example of a regulatory agency that's created by the New Deal specifically to address one of the problems of the depression that's still around today. Like if you walk into any bank today, you look around their lobby, somewhere you will see a plaque that says member FDIC insured um, if you don't walk right out of that bank and don't put your thing in. The way that Roosevelt informs the nation about this bank holiday is through a radio address, or what's going to become known as a fireside chat. Um, this is a nice kind of cozy term that Roosevelt used for his weekly presidential addresses. He would speak into the radio from the White House, and he would explain to people kind of what was going on in the New Deal, all about the different programs, and here's how you can apply, and this is what we're doing, this is why we're doing it. This was novel. This was not ever something that had been done before. It made a lot of people really feel like Roosevelt, um, like he cared about them, and like he was you know, thinking about them, even if, you know, you aren't directly feeling the impact of this program, so here's what's going on in the country. It's really um, crucial to, like, why people like Roosevelt so much, and, and many people do, um, is this fireside chat sort of created that sense of, like, connection between Roosevelt and the um, voting population. Uh, in the immediate, like, while the bank holiday is going on, again, like, within his first few days in office, he's also going to start to institute some reform of the stock market. So he's going to create by executive order the SEC, also still around today, Securities and Exchange Commission. And what that does is it regulates the stock market. So if you are buying on margin, for example, which is illegal today, the SEC will uh, sue you, stop you from doing that. If you're practicing insider trading or anything like that, so any of those, those cases where people are um, sued for like soft practices, those are all the SEC that does that, again, still today. And then just kind of in general what the, the general premise, I guess you could say, of the New Deal itself is this idea of increasing the money supply. So for a long time, and especially if you cast your mind back to like the populists from last minute, the big debate was this question of the gold standard, right? And do we stay on the gold standard? Do we go by metalists, et cetera? That was a big thing in the 1890s. We're going to sort of solve that once and for all in 1933 by um, going off the gold standard. So no longer for, from 1933 till today, the money that we print is not dependent on any, like, not to, you know, how much money we have in gold and gold knocks or anything like that. It's just based on the faith and credit of the American government. And if that doesn't scare you a little bit, it probably should. Um, but that is what our money is based on today. And we index our money to the, the price of gold for a while, like up to about the 1970s. But today it's just like, again, the money is just based on like the, the, the government, the strength of the government itself. Um, this, this practice of like expanding the money supply and circulation, Roosevelt referred to this by a metaphor that would have made instant sense to people in the 1930s, but is sort of obscure today. He called it priming the pump. I don't know if any of you have ever been on like an old farm and worked an old fashioned like pump handle pump, like where you're trying to get water out of the ground and you have to pump it. Um, the, this is, that's what this is about. Basically the way that those old pumps work, if you just walk up to them and you just like, you know, jam the handle up and down, you're not going to get anything out. It's not going to do anything. Um, what you have to do first is you have to pour a little bit of water in to the pump in order like to, to grease the mechanism and to get water out. So you've got to put water in to get water out. So the idea of pump priming, when you see that phrase, is this idea that you have to pump money into the economy in order to get the economy moving. That the government, like the, the thing that the government can and should do is put money into the economy at like the working or middle class level in order to sort of 
they, you know, then those people have money in their pockets and they go out and buy groceries. And then the grocery store owner can, you know, pay his employees and then sort of trickles out into the rest of society. This idea of pump priming is also known as Keynesian economics. So it's named after a British economist named John Maynard Keynes. That last name right there. And Keynesian economics or pump priming is still today the basic economic philosophy of the modern day Democratic Party. So in general, if you are a Democrat, economically, you believe that when times are bad, the best thing for the government to do is to pump money into the economy, that we should be spending more, that we should be putting that money out. It's called deficit spending because it's usually like spending money that you don't necessarily have on hand, um, putting money sort of into the bottom of society. If you're thinking like, okay, well then what's the Republican thing? The Republicans today, largely, again, this is a blanket statement, believe in sort of the opposite of this or what we're going to eventually call trickle-down economics. And that's something that's going to develop and that we'll get to when, when we get to Ronald Reagan in the 1980s. So Keynesian economics pump priming is the economic philosophy that like underpins the New Deal and that's going to um, continue to be the basic like economic belief of the Democratic Party for the next or, I mean, are arguably still till today. Um, important person in instituting the New Deal besides FDR is this lady right here. Her name is Frances Perkins. She's the first female um, cabinet member in American history, and she's the Secretary of Labor for the entirety of Roosevelt's presidency, which is, is really unusual. Usually cabinet secretaries rotate in and out more often. Um, so she's going to be really crucial. Eleanor and then FDR, those are some of our, and there's a lot of other advisors too, but those are some of the top people whose names you would need to know and associate with New Deal policy. Um, the New Deal itself produces a lot of different organizations. They're often referred to as like alphabet soup because uh, they usually go by their initials. So you have the FDIC, the SEC that we already talked about, both of these are regulatory agencies. We're going to click through a couple more um, examples of agencies. You can see a lot of these in this note set. This is the first New Deal. That obviously implies that there's a second New Deal coming up. So we, I've trimmed this down a lot just for the note set, but there's there these are, I mean, dozens if not hundreds of programs throughout the, the um, entirety of the New Deal itself. So um, one of the main types of like New Deal programs that you should be aware of are what are sometimes called jobs programs or make work programs, largely by people who don't like them. Um, and this is exactly what a jobs program sounds like. It's a program that's designed to give people jobs to a paycheck that's coming from the American government or from a private industry funded by the American government um, with the idea that once those people have money in their pockets that they will be able to spend that money. Um, so the c 2 is a jobs program. Um, the PWA is also a jobs program, although more construction based. There's your textbook gets into more detail on all these. So I'm going to flip back for these pretty quickly. Uh, the NRA was what Roosevelt considered the most important program of the first New Deal. Uh, it's also uh, one of the harder ones to explain. It's essentially a this is kind of a propaganda program in a way, in that it um, the NRA was trying to force industries to regulate themselves by imposing like fines and incentives on industries that that you know would sort of kind of fall in line and regulate like wages, hours, set codes for their industry. And then once they fell in line, they were allowed to sort of post this NRA blue eagle um, that was sort of a, a you know something that people were told to look for. You know, look for. Um, you know, businesses that display the NRA Eagle and sort of support them. You might notice that this ends at kind of a weird time, like 33 to 35, that's an awkward length for a New Deal program. And that's because this is eventually going to get struck down by the Supreme Court as like overreaching or sort of going too far um, in terms of government power. Um, at this, right about the same time Roosevelt takes office, unfortunately for him, we're going to see the kick up of like part a billion of the, the, new, the Great Depression, and that's the beginning of the Dust Bowl. Uh, the Dust Bowl is a term for this sort of region, it's kind of like highlighted in dark brown here or in color on this area, sort of like the Oklahoma Panhandle, like Texas, Kansas, Colorado, New Mexico, a little bit, kind of that whole area right there. Um, that's got a, a couple things going on. It's, there's been a severe drought, and it's going to continue to be a severe drought for a few more years. Really, uh, like generational overproduction. This is all area that we moved out to under the Homestead Act, an area that it probably shouldn't have been farmed that much in the first place. It's dry, it's deserty, it's like the plains, it's very prairie-esque down there, lots of like long grasses, and it's just not really made for long-term cultivation. We've also got hardcore machinery like deep furrow plows and um, like mechanical tractors and things like that that are um, putting a lot more stress on the land than it's really able to handle, and they're eroding the, the topsoil. They're like depleting all of the nutrients out of it and making it really dry and crumbly. 
And when you take really dry and crumbly soil and you add drought and then you add wind, serious of wind storms that we're going to see in like 34, 35, what you get uh, is this. You get giant clouds of like black dust that um, engulf whole areas of, you know, states and whole areas of the country. Uh, you know, they look pretty apocalyptic. It's not like a twister, like it wouldn't pick you up and set you down. Um, but what it does do is make the area like pretty unlivable while the dust storm is going on. And then when the dust storm is over, all the dust drops out of the sky and falls down on top of everything that's left outside. So it kills animals, it kills crops, especially uh, machinery can get clogged and ruined if it's left outside during a dust storm. So you've got this, this category of people, these depression era farmers who are already right, living on the edge um, of any sort of prosperity. And then the, the dust bowl just kind of finishes them off. And so most of them are going to either lose their mortgage or, like, give up on their mortgage, essentially, um, pack up whatever they've got and um, head out. That's where most of them wind up heading out to or attempting to head out to is to California. Um, so you leave, like, the Oklahoma Panhandle and here you climb in your old, you know, beater jalopy that the family's had for, like, 10 years or whatever, strap all your belongings to it and take maybe Route 66 down here out towards Los Angeles or come up, you know, on Highway 30 and come into, like, Northern California, et cetera. So this, this term Okies up here was, like, a derogatory term that people in California use to mean, like, uh, you know, kind of like what we might call, like, white trash today, right, or the bum, a right, low class. Um, is people who are coming from this Dust Bowl region. About a third of the Okies who come to California during this time period are going to go back. Um, but that means that two-thirds stay. So this is a really significant and sizable migration of, like, population in the U.S. that's driven by the Dust Bowl. A couple of uh, last First New Deal programs that deal with the, like, issues of rural America. The AAA, the Agricultural Adjustment Agency, um, is also one of the ones that's going to get struck down by the Supreme Court. It's not so much this, like, loans to help mortgages part that's fairly not unpopular so this first part um what the aa did was it paid farmers not to produce as much so if you usually raised 100 hogs and sold them to slaughter it would pay you to only sell 50 of those hogs and instead just like kill the other 50 and you know bury them in a pit out back that type of thing this is another one that the supreme court's going to strike down as like overreach um, the SES still around today. They're going to try to teach farmers how to like treat the soil correctly, and they're also going to buy up a bunch of abandoned farms and return them to like natural grassland state to try to help the the general erosion issue. Um, and then lastly, and, and probably most importantly of these farming ones, is the TVA or the Tennessee Valley Authority that is the federal government responding to a specific regional issue, right? It's not all over the country. It's just in this Tennessee River Valley area. And what they're going to do is they're going to build dams. You can see all these little gray slashes across the river here. Those are all dams that were built by the TVA to control flooding. Um, they're hydroelectric, so they're going to generate electricity. This is the last area of the country to be really electrified. Most of these areas didn't have electricity before the TVA. And it's also going to open up some new like actual farmable farmland, not like the, you know, not like Oklahoma, but a good, like solid, fertile land that people can sort of make a living farming. That's TVA. So around today, it, it runs the dams and the electric plants. Um, so that's the first part of this note set. We're going to pause right here, um, and you can pick up with the second part, uh, which is also posted online. That's going to look at the impact of this first new deal on various groups of people, and then also on, of course, the second new deal and the ending of the depression.